Good morning, everybody. My name is Florian Eder. I'm your host today. I write Brussels Playbook, our uh, morning briefing, morning newsletter, and this is my great pleasure uh, to take Brussels Playbook live today after uh, a quite a long break for the first time for a, a Brussels Playbook live interview, uh, even if it's virtual for uh, most of you viewers online. It is my great pleasure and honor to welcome Commissioner Thierry Breton today here on stage, the commissioner, as you know, uh, for the internal market. Um, for this first uh, installment of our political fall events uh, just on the day of the Grand Rentrée this morning. It's a great pleasure uh, to have you here for, for an interview. I would like to thank you, uh, viewers online. I would like to thank uh, our partner, Etno, for uh, making this virtual event actually possible. Uh, and I will start with some housekeeping remarks uh, for you out there. I would like to encourage you to ask questions. Of course, since you're not in the room, you can ask questions online via Slido. So go to slide.do on your phone, your computer, your tablet, whatever you have, and use the hashtag politicalbreton as, as the hashtag to ask your questions. They will appear here in front of me, and I will pick and, uh, and ask them, actually. Um, to get you used to it and to start things off, we have a poll um, because we're interested in your opinion. Uh, so if you go to Slido, you can uh, answer our question here. What is the main impact of COVID-19 on the European single market, on the internal market? There's four options. There is still a lack of harmonization, for example, member states' decisions on traveling on the national borders. That's one option. The other option is um, it gives an opportunity for the Commission to harmonize national regulations and remove regulatory barriers that, base, that businesses face by imposing common EU rules. A third option would be it creates opportunities for industry to bring back industry at home, or it hasn't changed just anything. That is the options, are the options that we have this morning. So uh, give it a, give it a uh, thought, uh, follow maybe our, uh, the initial part and stretch of our discussion here, uh, and we will come back to that uh, at the end of this conversation, which will last about 50 minutes. Before, uh, we kick it off. I would like to hand over to Lise Fuhr, the uh, Director General of Etna, our partner, for a few introductory remarks. Lise, the floor is yours. Thank you, Florian. And good morning to all our viewers across Europe. And a huge thank you to Commissioner Breton and to Politico for this opportunity to debate one of the hottest topics of today's societal and political landscape, the interaction between technology and society. Well, I speak to you from the viewpoint of Europe's first technology sector, that's the telecommunications. And today, according to Forbes 100 Digital Index, telecom is Europe's major technology business, and it generates a value added of 137 billion per year. Beyond numbers, what are we really about that's the intimate link between new technologies and the socioeconomic opportunities. Our work today is focused on giving Europe the digital backbone of the future. And it's also focused on the inclusion of all European citizens in the digital era. It's building 5G, it's building fiber networks, and most importantly, activating a European digital ecosystem that can complete globally. But what are the debates that will define whether Europe can achieve global digital leadership? The first one, in our view, is around Europe's strategic independence. Let me be clear about this. I truly believe that this is not about protectionism. As the US and China are locking horns, the EU has an opportunity to propose a third way. One that's built not only on regulation, but mainly on a renewed belief in our own market players in tech. Let's talk about global leadership and empower European companies so that they can innovate more and scale up and get global. That brings me 
to what I believe is the second defining debate, building on an ethical approach to technology. Europe is best placed to do that because of the historical attention we have had to fundamental rights, to sustainability, and to privacy. Just take artificial intelligence. It was Europe's corporations who first rushed to develop ethical codes. And they got together with the Commission and developed a European approach to ethical AI. I think this provides a clear example of why more European presence on the international tech markets will be good news, not only for Europeans, but also for the citizens and the consumers across the globe. Finally, and I think the third defining debate is how Europe and its member states will use the EU funds dedicated to recovery. The digital gap of some European territories was laid bare by the initial phases of the pandemic. Too many European SMEs were not on the cloud in March. Too many healthcare providers and public administrations were not digitized. The European Commission has done bold work in securing Europe's biggest recovery package ever. Now governments must take advantage of these funds to create long-term and sustainable transformation in these economies. Taking up digital technologies is the way to do that. So I would like to conclude by thanking Commissioner Breton and by thanking the entire college for their leadership in these past difficult months. But I would also like to ask them to keep it up. We need continued political leadership in the face of misinformation. From vaccines to 5G, it truly pollutes the democratic debate. We need your leadership and vision to support our sector in increasing investment in connectivity. We need brave choices on the Digital Services Act to promote an open and fair competition in digital economy in Europe and around the globe. And we need a strong European voice that work with national governments to digitally transform economies and make them sustainable. And ultimately, that is that we need a strong European Commission that continues to advance European solutions beyond just national borders. Thank you. And over to you, Florian. Thank you, Lisa, for these introductory remarks. Commissioner, before we, uh, before we come to tech and the internal market, uh, we're uh, at the day of the rentrée. Um, tomorrow is a college meeting, and you, over the summer, lost a member of that college with the resignation of, of Commissioner Phil Hogan. Would you agree that this is quite a blow to the, to the Commission as a whole uh, to lose an important member, obviously, of an, uh, responsible for, for an important matter over the summer? Well, Commissioner Hogan um, has been a, a, a tremendous commissioner. He's a previous commission, of course, in agriculture and rural development. But of course, I know him uh, since he was uh, a responsible for trade. Um, we worked a lot together, a lot. And I have many memories where we, we were discussing with, uh, with the US, where we were in Davos to discuss with uh, uh, President von der Leyen, uh, he and myself with uh, President Trump. It was quite, uh, quite a discussion. Um, uh, when we, during the crisis, by the way, every Saturday morning, uh, Phil, myself, and, uh, and uh, um, some of our counterparts in China have a, were having discussions about trade relations and, of course, everything which was related to the so-called diplomacy of masks and so on. And uh, we were always on the same page, Phil, and myself. He was a great, co a great colleague, and he's a, he's a great friend. So, of course, um, it's sad, but, um, but uh, he, he, um, we have to acknowledge that um, um, 
he decided that um, the distraction that he, he was coping with in uh, his country uh, was not compatible with his mission. And I think we have to uh, recognize that. And uh, he took the decision. Does that set a, a, a precedent, a precedent, maybe even a, a risky precedent, if what you call this dis distraction by a public opinion and but mainly also by the Irish government uh, uh, leads to the resignation of a, of a commissioner? Does that is that is that uh, dangerous? No, I understand very well the meaning behind your question, and I don't think so. I think his decision was a personal decision. Um, you know, Phil was also thinking, as you remember that, uh, one time to be maybe a candidate for WTO, and then he decided that, that he could not because the timing was too long and it could be distracted. distracted. And then, uh, for the same reason, he could not afford to, um, to, to handle his mission and to be, uh, um, to be distracted by, by what happened in, in his own country. And I think this is how we should regard this. Now, of course, um, um, President von der Leyen mentioned it. We will uh, soon have uh, a new colleague. Um, uh, now she's waiting for the proposal from the Irish government, and then, of course, um, the person, a man or lady, will have to be voted by uh, the parliament, and, uh, and soon we'll have a new colleague. And I will, I will, and I, and I will keep my, my friendship with, uh, with Phil. In case there is a, uh, you mentioned it, there's two options basically, either the Irish government sends somebody who can take over Phil Hogan's portfolio uh, or there is a, a reshuffle of the... That's not what I said, um, that's what you said. That's what I said. <laughs> okay, good, no, no. You mentioned that you're waiting for, an, for, Absolutely. A, for a new proposal, Absolutely. depending uh, on which proposal it is. There are. I said uh, a, man, a man or a lady, or, or probably a man and a lady. Probably. Anyways, my question is if there is a reshuffle of the responsibilities in the, in the commission, in the, in the uh, college, would your uh, portfolio be impacted, you think? How do you want me to answer this question? Uh, we even don't know who will be, so I think it's. Uh, it's not, uh, uh, I, 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 I recognize your question. Uh, I think it's relevant for you, it's not relevant for me. Would you be interested in the trade portfolio? I, I, ask directly. I, 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 I have a lot of things in my, in my, in my portfolio, as you know. So, uh, so if you ask me if, uh, if it could be a good idea to add it to my portfolio, I don't know. I, mean, I have really a lot of things to do. <laughs> we come to uh, the lot of things that you, that you have to do in a, in a minute, but let's just stay on trade for, for one more uh, minute. Um, Trade policy seems to be in, in troubled waters or uh, undergoing a deep change, um, not only because of, of Phil Hogan's uh, resignation, but another uh, piece of news that came out over the summer is that uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel for the first time actually made a, a, a quite considerable, I would even say, U-turn when it comes to Mercosur, one of the important uh, trade agreements that is uh, on the table but not yet uh, uh, ratified, of course, uh, and she criticized it and said she would not be able to uh, support it in the current form, while a year ago uh, she was an ardent defender of it. Is that, how, how do you read the situation? Has the global mood changed? Is it um, uh, a Franco-German entente where uh, Germany moves more uh, to a more critical position that France uh, has had from the outset? What's your reading of this? Uh, no, there's a lot of aspect in your question, Florian. And, um, um, <laughs> Needless to say that, yes, I mean, uh, the world is changing. That's obvious. It was already changing before the crisis. And you remember that uh, um, um, in my portfolio, uh, I, I took in consideration these changes when I presented the industrial strategy of, uh, of Europe. Um, but of course, all these trends, more green, more digital, more resilient, uh, more independent, we already mentioned all this theme before the crisis. You remember that very well. And what I said is that, of course, and I'm not the only one, a crisis of this magnitude um, very often in history accelerated this trend, including everything we said before. So yes, of course, what was negotiated for maybe one or two years ago, and if even more, because as you know, for trade relations, it takes, it takes years to, uh, to finally get to an agreement, is probably not up to date today. And, uh, and yes, you mentioned in the second aspect of your question the fact that uh, um, in, in, in the crisis, definitely yes, uh, France and Germany are uh, more aligned than ever, which is a really a good thing. Of course, France and Germany are not making the policy in Europe, but of course, it is important that they are on the same page. And we should be, uh, uh, I think, happy that, uh, that we see Chancellor Merkel and President Macron on almost all aspects 
being now fully aligned, it means, of course, that we need then to, uh, uh, or they need uh, to convince all their colleagues to go in this direction. But it's more easy when they align than where they are not. Uh, you mentioned one of the trends, uh, and you um, actually, uh, in case people have noticed, you uh, kept yourself busy over the summer by writing actually a, a whole series of op-eds for a number of, of European newspapers uh, in four parts, um, where in one part at least uh, you write that the EU's trade policy and the EU's industrial policy, and it interlinks, of course, as we know, should become more, more assertive, and Europe should uh, take a more assertive stance when it comes to, uh, to foreign powers. Um, concretely, I remember you mentioned in, in one of these articles, uh, you mentioned public procurement as an area where the EU has been a little bit naive. Can you elaborate a little bit on this, what it means for you um, to change that? How should Europe change? <laughs> I was not expecting you to mention my, uh, 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 what I did during the summertime. <laughs> Uh, but it's true that I saw that during this break, I thought it was probably interesting, uh, uh, at least for me, probably also for, um, for our stakeholders, um, uh, to stop a little bit and to, and to try to understand what happened, uh, to realize the change of magnitude of this crisis already uh, um, uh, changed in our way of working together and, of, and also uh, for Europe. And then, of course, to be prepared for the future. And that's why I, 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 I thought it was maybe uh, uh, um, appropriate to, um, uh, to, 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 to elaborate on the 100 days uh, uh, which have changed Europe. And in one of these uh, episodes, mm -hmm. uh, it's true that uh, um, I was integrating myself on, on resilience. And, and of the fact also, but it was not new also, you know that with uh, uh, my colleague uh, and friend, Joseph Borrell, we wrote an op-ed together on, on the Europe uh, uh, should be not naive anymore. Or the time where Europe was naive is over. And it's this time of naivety, uh, 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 you could develop it in many aspects, including uh, for um, uh, the supply of some of our critical uh, um, resources. But of course, uh, this one on, um, on, 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 on the TV uh, every day during the crisis, and especially for the medical supplies. You remember that very well. But not only, because then we realized, oh, we need also probably to have some um, uh, production uh, in, in, in medication, uh, in antibiotics, and so on. And then we realized, oh, we don't have it anymore in Europe. Um, so uh, it, was, it was for many of our uh, European fellow citizens um, uh, sort of a wake-up call, and um, and and uh, we started before uh, when when I, um, I was working with my team um, at DigiGrow um, uh, for the industrial strategy. We had already um, uh, uh, started a big uh, a big part of our thinking in uh, critical uh, uh, part. You know, we are speaking about digital twin transition. Twin transition means, of course, the green one, but also the digital one. But behind this, and I know pretty well this, it was part of my former uh, job. Uh, uh, believe me, you have a lot of rare earths. Uh, iridium, borate, uh, magnesium, uh, uh, everything you can, you, you can imagine which ends by uh, yum. Uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is needed uh, for screens, for, for microprocessors, for microchips, for, for um, uh, uh, wind wheel, for, for everything. And of course, uh, 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 we are dependent uh, uh, for f from few countries slash uh, providers, suppliers. And, um, and it's important uh, uh, to start to think a little bit, to project ourselves in 10 years and 30 years the time of the Green Deal, to, uh, to make sure that we will have everything we need and to organize ourselves. But the good news is that we have a lot of resources in Europe, but we need to, uh, to identify where, where they are. We need to identify also um, how to be able to, uh, are we able to extract them? Uh, do we want to extract them? Under which condition? Uh, or, um, uh, of course, taking care of the environment. Uh, at, at what price? So that's the questions, of course, that we need to ask ourselves. And, and yes, this is, this is, we will have, by the way, communication um, uh, Thursday on this, on this uh, very topic, uh, Florian. 
and for the first time you not only describe uh, the, the, the state of play and raw materials and uh, things, but for the first time I think the Commission is going to issue an action plan on this. So what Absolutely, you but uh, if, you, if you allow me, uh, if, uh, I sh probably should wait uh, uh, until Thursday to... to I think again, you are into <laughs> telling us a little bit of what the action No, we will have 10 actions, right? we will have, we will have, we will have, we will, we will announce an alliance uh, in this uh, raw material, but, but uh, um, uh, wait until Thursday and you will be the first one to get it. And, uh, <laughs> but what is important, uh, you know, like always, in everything I do, um, uh, we, need, we need to be extremely clear and honest and frank. Uh, we need to issue exactly the situation where it is. Um, uh, and, 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 and then, of course, to see what we need in terms of alliances, partnership, uh, um, everything which will be needed uh, to be, um, uh, to be uh, more self-sufficient, independent, uh, uh, autonomous, some say sovereign, uh, uh, in this area and in others. That's our job and our mission. Part of the, the international environment and, and difficult partners uh, is, some would say, uh, the United States, and you mentioned your uh, discussion with President Trump in, in Davos, for example. Um, let me just ask a very, a very concrete question. Um, is, is TikTok a security risk also in Europe? I will not, you know, uh, Flan, I'm not in the business of banning any company. I'm in the business of explaining very clearly what are our rules. When I was a Minister of Finance, I always, always said to my stakeholders, in economy, you need to have lisibility, you need to be clear. All the players stakeholders involved, need to know what are the rules. When I was a CEO, I was expecting in any countries we were working on to have clear rules. And it was our responsibility to follow these rules. So it's the same thing now in my portfolio. My mission, together with my team, is to make sure that everyone understands our rules. And if they're not clear, like for example for the DSA, to enhance it to work so that everybody will understand. When I have discussions, and you, you know that I had so many discussions with the platform's leaders, I'm very clear. Sometimes they say I'm tough. No, I'm not tough. I'm clear. I know them very well. Mm -hmm. But I know that they need to have clarity. So now let's come back to TikTok. What is the key subject? The key subject, like in many things, we'll have to discuss today and in the following months or years together, is data. And it's true that data are key. So I think uh, the Trump administration is right, finally, to recognize that there is an ownership on data, that you better control your data. But for the one who know me, it's not new. For the past 10 years, on many aspects, governmental, public sector, or private sector, I was always advocating one single sentence. European data should be stored and processed in Europe, where they're produced in Europe, because they belong to Europe. They belong to us, to our companies, to the public sectors. And, and, and uh, there is nothing to be protectionist while saying that. Nothing. Just, and by the way, we welcome anybody to process or store our data, European company or not, in Europe, as long as the laws and regulation on European data are exclusively European laws. Mm -hmm. I hope I'm clear. And that's why uh, uh, I'm not surprised that President Trump just suddenly realized uh, uh, that uh, it's absolutely critical. But it's not our way to behave. Our way is to issue regulation or clear rules. I prefer to say rules. Uh, by the way, we did it for GDPR. Mm -hmm. uh, we will continue to do it for, for the uh, digital uh, um, the DSA. It's absolutely important. It's clear. But you have here my philosophy behind. And, um, and, and of course, for us, uh, it's not a question of dismantling this or that. 
it's just a question of making sure that European data stay in Europe. Is there... And especially you, for the industrial data, by the way, sorry to interrupt, mm. which is the big new fight, and you know this is one of my, my, my hottest topics, because the new wave in terms of data, we are talking mainly on personal data now, but the largest, biggest wave is coming now from industrial data within the next... I mean, in my mandate, in our mandate, in the von der Leyen Commission mandate, for the next four years, today we have 40 zettabytes of data on this planet, 40,000 billion of billion of data. That's, that's, that's our legacy. We double this number every 18 months. Mm -hmm. And where will they come from? Mainly from industrial uh, data. Where the new fight, the new battle will start. And we are pretty well positioned here. And my job is to make sure that all our European companies will be able to benefit from it. Because we have the expertise, we are producing this data, uh, we have the know-how, we have the experts. So I have, I have to make sure that, of course, uh, uh, um, our companies will be able to do, uh, to do the job. And, 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 they, and they can. They're better positioned than many others. And you're going to propose legislation on this? Uh, on it's this not data. legislation. It's also tools. Mm -hmm. Tools. So, uh, and, 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 and we have many subjects. For example, um, uh, you, you know, I'm not always in favor of, uh, of, 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 of regulation. Of course, legislation is extremely important. But sometime in this new world, you can be as um, 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 efficient uh, with uh, uh, soft law than with uh, hard law. And this is something that I experienced uh, when I was a professor at, uh, 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 in Boston. Mm -hmm. And this is what I was teaching to my students in terms of governance. Soft law is extremely important. This is exactly what we, what we used for the pretty successfully with the 5G strategy. In other words, what do I mean by soft law? It's just asking for responsibilities also of these players. They understand uh, uh, what we want, and it is their mission to adapt to ourselves and not vice versa. And by the way, if it does happen, yes, we will regulate. You know, during the crisis, I had many, many discussions, almost on a weekly basis, with all these big players. Uh, because at the end of the day, um, uh, we just realized uh, that uh, the, what I'm calling the information society or digital society was becoming so important, especially where we were obliged to stay at home, that we were dependent on these telecom uh, systems, network, and so on. So I had, I had almost weekly discussions with all these players to make sure that, uh, that uh, uh, um, uh, they will provide the services, uh, that uh, uh, we will not have fake news, uh, that uh, uh, many, many things. And believe me, what they did was something which was probably not expected in the, uh, uh, in, in the previous period. So we can, uh, again, smoothly have them to adapt themselves to what we need. And again, uh, I'm not naive. I know that some things will be able to do it this way, uh, but other things we will have to regulate, yes. I'm asking also because I think I've been in Brussels for a bit, and I think it was eight years ago when I first heard from then Commissioner Reding that uh, European data should be stored and processed in Europe. Uh, what, what makes you sure or more optimistic that uh, it will happen this time around? But before, you know, eight years, we had not exactly the same regulations. Uh, now you have many countries, um, uh, our continent, uh, which are very, um, uh, which change, their, or, or including their laws. Uh, regarding their positions, our companies operating uh, technology and data outside, outside um, of their own frontier. Uh, and you know, what makes me sure? I, I'm, not, I'm not certain. I, I'm, I'm not naive. Uh, I know it's a, it's, a, it's a fight, yes, but um, I can tell you that um, after the GDPR, something extremely important change um, in the boardrooms. All the board members in Europe, Florian, are responsible now, personally, if there is a breach in data security in the company where there are board members, personally. And believe me, having been myself a board member, I could tell you that this is a, a big change factor mm -hmm. uh, for the behavior of these companies. Mm -hmm. What do I mean by that? If there is a problem, an issue, and the company is sued, 
now the judge will go to see what happened in the boardroom. So then we ask, how did you take the decision? Why did you let the data to be, uh, to be sent outside where you knew, you knew that the regulation was, were not protecting for your customers? Mm -hmm. I'll let you answer this question. Mm -hmm. I propose we look into some concrete questions on this whole data strategy, uh, data thing that we got here on, on Slido just for a minute. Um, there is one, there was one that has disappeared now. Um, but let's start with this one. How does the EU plan to safeguard its tech players and ecosystem against Turk? No, it's not, but we take it anyways. How does the EU plan to safeguard its tech players and ecosystem against third country sanctions, which will lead to the breakup of the globalized supply chains? So that's, uh, I, I'm, I'm first, um, um, it's true that during the crisis, we have seen that um, um, the supply chain of our companies, which has been a strength uh, on a global basis, uh, was in some cases a weakness. And I remember very well uh, the discussion we had together, uh, coming back with Phil and, and myself, uh, Phil again, and we were discussing with our, our um, uh, Chinese counterpart. Uh, and I remember very well one discussion we had when we realized that, of course, during the crisis and the situation, the priority, and it was expressed to us like this, uh, was uh, uh, given uh, to the uh, people of the uh, um, uh, Republic of China, uh, including in the supply chain existing, including with companies which were um, European companies. So, I mean, I mean uh, and, uh, okay, I could understand that, but it's a change. Then let's be clear. We just need to reorganize ourselves because we realized that uh, um, uh, what we believed uh, 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 was um, uh, working forever is not. So yes, it's true that we and companies, and of course we have to work hand to hand because we will not do it ourselves, uh, but companies, big companies will have to readjust their supply chain, diversify their resources. So um, now, uh, regarding the, the technological aspect uh, on, 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 on your question, that's a geopolitical aspect, but there's also a technical aspect, and especially um, in the sourcing of, uh, of key components. Um, uh, you know, the Chancellor, uh, um, uh, Angela Merkel, um, um, spoke uh, recently about, uh, for the German presidency, that one of her goals uh, was to, uh, um, to enhance, to achieve, to develop um, uh, European digital sovereignty. It, it was a wordings. And I think it matched pretty well with also what uh, Emmanuel Macron had in mind. Um, uh, what does it mean by this? It means, of course, that we need to, to think uh, what will uh, 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 make, uh, put us in a situation to avoid this kind of, um, of subject. And here also, uh, we, we should not be naive. Uh, we have some partners, uh, we have some very good partners, but we know also that in some areas, and especially in technologies, we are dependent. So personally, uh, I had to work and to think uh, together with my team uh, for the college uh, at the request of uh, President von der Leyen um, on, on, on what, what, what could be, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, the umbrella of, uh, of a digital sovereignty. Uh, and, and to make a long so story short, um, um, uh, we, we worked on three pillars. We said that the first one, we need to have a European cloud secured under European law uh, 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 for industrial data. You, you know the story of GaiaX. It will be an, an, an enhancement of GaiaX for, again, industrial data. And I think it's extremely important. Uh, we have, you know, building a platform uh, for, um, 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 let's say, um, uh, personal use like uh, Facebook and others is important, it's, 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 it's good. It's, it's not as complex as building a platform for industrial data where you store the, the, the data produced locally mm -hmm. in an automated car, in a, in a digital factory where you need to react at the millisecond, uh, where you need to make sure of everything. So the, 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 these KPIs, are extremely, extremely demanding, and it's not the same thing. So we need to have here to build our, 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 our own 
um, uh, a foundation. The second thing is, of course, in terms of, uh, of semiconductors and mainly processors. And that's true that these parts are absolutely critical and will become even more critical, especially for HPC, supercomputer, but also edge computers. We will have a lot of edge computers at the edge uh, uh, where we will produce this data. It's absolutely important that we, uh, we have already so a lot of resources know how in Europe, but we need to enhance it and we need to be self-sufficient in it. And I know, I'm not naive, I know this very well. It's a, it's a big exercise, but it's important. Uh, um, and the third thing will be, of course, uh, um, in, in terms of connectivity, it's absolutely critical that we control, maintain our connectivity. We are doing pretty well, uh, and um, uh, thanks to uh, the telco operators and the, uh, in, um, in fiber optics, but we need also now to move to the next generation, which will be, of course, uh, critical networks, including using um, um, uh, quantum encryption. Uh, uh, that's absolutely critical. I'm pushing a lot this. This will mean probably to have some low Earth uh, satellite, because I'm doing this by satellite, uh, being able to do this all over Europe. And by the way, using also this low Earth satellite to, um, to be able to, um, to avoid any, um, any zone where we, when you don't have connectivity. So that's basically the three pillars that we need, of course, to think about, to develop together um, with public and private money, using our tools, uh, making sure that competition is respected. But I think it's extremely important uh, to address these three pillars to build, again, our digital sovereignty. So you just outlined, if I, if I got you right, uh, the, uh, the digital sovereignty strategy that you will, uh, that we will push for. Is this the big project for, for this fall for you? It's not only for the fall. I think it should be definitely uh, a, a European project for, uh, if we want, again, if we want, and this is what we want, what we need, uh, to make sure that we will control our destiny, um, and we will not miss the new industrial wave. Let's be clear, yes, we miss the first wave, the personal data. We miss it, you know why? Because again, it's not rocket science to build a platform, as I said. Uh, but what is important is to have a large market. Mm -hmm. And in the US, uh, when, uh, when, um, when the Facebook or, 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 or Google or, or, or Twitter of this world started, they had already a large market. Same thing in China where the Baltic started, uh, um, they had a large market. We have a large market, but it was too fragmented. Also in terms of language. Of language, of culture, of everything, yeah. of barriers. Uh, so uh, that's why, again, OK, we missed it. But now the new big story, uh, and now we are regulating it, we are adapting it to our words, to our values, which are so important. Uh, 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 and, uh, and, and now, of course, we need to be ready to build this industrial data strategy. Uh, totally linked with the industrial data and with the, with the internal market, totally linked. We need to build it now, and if we want to build it, uh, we need to make sure that we control the, the three pillars of the foundation I just mentioned. Is that, we've got a question here from Margot Dor. Is Gaia X an attempt to replicate for cloud and data the success of, uh, of, of EU policy in, in mobile communications 30 years or so ago? <laughs> So mobile, that's a good question, because uh, uh, that's a very, very good question. Uh, it's, it's very true, and I, and, and I like to, 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 um, to recall to, uh, to, to all of us that uh, we have been always, always leading in mobile communication, including in 5G. Today, Europe is the leading continent in 5G in terms of patents and contracts. We are, we are happy to have two European global companies, and these two companies are having more patents than others. Mm -hmm. I don't mention anyone, and I respect anyone. They're all good companies, but this is fact. And it is true that so you... So there's no reason for uh, anyone you wouldn't mention to be involved? Uh, no, I mean, this is just a fact. I just want to have to be fact, you know. Facts are extremely important. I just reiterate the facts. But it's true also that when we, when we come from 4G, 3G, 2G, and, and the GSM, it was an invention of Europe. So we have a lot of expertise here. But that's why I want to launch already some, uh, some new thinking and research, and research in, uh, in 6G, 6G and in encryption and in quantum technologies. Uh, um, so so um, uh, we, we have everything here, but we need to work together. We need to work together. 
Quick thing from here, you mentioned the broadband quantum satellite constellation. Is this under the MFF, asks Marc Lejeune here on slide. No, it's not, it's not exactly under, 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 under MFF, really, but we have, we have already a pretty solid... Um, um, uh, uh, by the way, it's also a good question because it, 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 it could um, allow me to, to tell you that uh, the budget for space... Well, I mean, we, are, we are a very large and powerful continent in terms of space. We are the second power, space power on this planet. Uh, and we do a lot of things, and we'll do a lot of things. By the way, our budget in space is, is increasing uh, uh, versus the previous uh, uh, commission, the previous MFF, which is important. But of course, uh, uh, we have now um, uh, tools. The tools could, could be ICPCI, the tools could be also the recovery plan, uh, uh, the tools could be also uh, the um, um, uh, European Defence Fund. So we have many tools that we could maybe probably, uh, probably mobilise. It's too early to say. Uh, my job first, with my team, is just to try to enlighten uh, what is important to, for our continent to make sure that we control our destiny. And then, of course, uh, but, but it's true that the, the recovery plan um, um, it, it could be also a good tool. One more here from a uh, detailed one from Slido, from Alessandro. Uh, already one year ago, DG Grow was expected to launch a study on data management in vehicles. Any news on uh, this what? timing? Uh? On data management in vehicles. And in use on this timing, data management in, 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 in cars. Yeah, yeah. And in use on on the timing is the question no, here. No, I don't have. And no, I don't. Have, I don't have news. Okay. Sorry, uh, sorry, <laughs> I don't have news. But I will. I will, I will, I will look at. It. I'm, I'm. I'm trying to do things a little bit broader. Sure. Uh, not <laughs> only. Not only for vehicles, but for again. Uh, by the way, using using 5G networks. That's why 5G are so important because, of course, with 5G we will have we will be able to deploy a lot of uh, uh, small antennas and being able again to have the kind of uh, um, uh, direct communication where again, which is extremely important, where the data are, pro are, are are produced, where the data are produced, we need not to delocalize some computing power. That's why the edge computers and 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 and, and the uh, processors uh, are so important. Uh, and also the platforms, uh, uh, the, the, the small cloud uh, localized uh, uh, where the data are produced. So that's exactly the whole strategy okay. behind this. There is one more thing on, on data. Um, I think you can say that the, uh, the coronavirus has also shown a, a certain need to share, share more data in, in, in particular on, in the health sector. Is there, um, uh, the question is, uh, should should tech companies such as Amazon, Google, and Facebook be obliged to share more of this data uh, with competitors and with the public sector for something that you could call a public good? That's, that's a very important and very sensitive subject. Nothing, if I may say so, is more important than our health data. It really belongs to us. And in the intimacy of the relation that we have with our doctors, or our hospitals. That's something which is absolutely mandatory. And we cannot compromise with this. We cannot compromise. Now, this being said, you have in the periphery of these data, you have a lot of uh, things that we can work, we can work on. Uh, some are not so important or so critical. Um, uh, uh, some could be shared if we define clearly under which condition. But this will have to be discussed absolutely clearly. And, uh, and with uh, always in mind what I just mentioned. You know, for us in Europe, health is still a prerogative of member states. And I think it's important because it should be close to us. And this is at the end of the day what our fellow citizens are willing. They, are, they, have, they have trust. Trust for us is important. So proximity is important. But it's true also that for some more general data, we could probably do things always on an anonymized way. And that's why I think that we, we want to enhance, to launch a consultation on this, because that's something that we could probably propose things, but exactly like we did with the GDPR, under very strict rules. 
you have an idea on the time frame of no we want to start now but uh, but but, uh, but this is a uh, uh, we, we should not rush because we don't want to do it absolutely uh, uh, properly by the way you have seen that uh, um, uh, one of the requests it's uh, it's weird but one of the requests that we had uh, at the commission uh, during the crisis together with my colleague uh, uh, Stella Kayakides uh, is that uh, uh, member said ask us for more coordination especially when we were lacking of uh, these critical components, uh, equipments. Uh, so now we inherited a little bit this uh, coordination. Uh, we see this also for vaccines. So I think we probably more and more in the, in, in the near future, by the way, we, 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 we enhance our health budget a lot uh, in, the, in, the new, in, in the new MFF. So uh, yes, it's true that, that probably uh, we, 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 we can expect and we have to expect to have the commission to be more involved in terms of coordination but still, this discussion will, will have also to be, to, to, to be kept at the level of member states. That's important. I'd like to briefly come to, um, uh, back actually to uh, some industrial policy uh, issues. As uh, France just announced um, to subsidize the reshoring of, of certain industries uh, as one of the lessons learned in the, in the COVID crisis also, but more, more generally, I think. Is that something uh, that you would uh, back, that you would uh, think is a good idea? To reshore? To reshore uh, certain industries, including health and agri-food, electronics. Like what, for example? Uh, from, you know, uh, to subsidize uh, companies to come back to France or to Europe. But it's not, I mean, uh, I mean again, um, uh, uh, we have strict rules. Um, and I want to enlarge a little bit your question, which is extremely important. We allow, together with my colleague, um, uh, Margaret Vestager, very quickly, uh, member states, uh, to subsidize. Uh, um, uh, companies uh, which, uh, which need it. And it was a, a premiere. Uh, we did it extremely quickly and, uh, um, and it was necessary. Uh, but of course, uh, um, we have to make sure that this will not create some distortion in concurrence. Mm. So we probably need to do this on a limited period of time, controlling it and to make sure that it, um, it's, uh, it fits with, uh, with our competition rules. Uh, now, this being said, um, um, uh, we are speaking about uh, uh, sovereignty, and it's important uh, that, again, for some specific aspect of uh, our supply chains, uh, we'll be able to have some, not everything, uh, I, I know I read sometimes some things where we said we will uh, uh, um, relocalize all our industry, which is absolutely not true. Uh, don't expect this. But to have some key components of key parts uh, being uh, built in Europe uh, uh, could be something, yes, that we could, uh, that we could do. As long as uh, it is done uh, um, in, 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 in a global view, respecting, uh, understanding, understood by everyone and respecting our competition rules, Yes, it could be, could, be, could be an idea, but we have to be cautious. You wrote, I'm coming back one, one more time to your article, to your uh, series of articles that is uh, the 100 days, the first 100 days of the crisis changed Europe, uh, as a few things have changed Europe before. Um, still, when you uh, look at Europe and the internal market and the, and, and the current stage of today, let's say, there is uh, a kind of a jungle, and we talked about that before, before people could, could listen in, uh, a kind of jungle when it comes to travel restrictions, uh, different rules, uh, uh, different sets of uh, measures, uh, and so on and so on. Is that something that uh, you, the internal market commissioner, uh, that harms the, uh, the integrity of the internal market? No, that's a very important question, and, uh, and, 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 and I know it was, um, it was uh, behind the mind of, uh, of a lot of people, and it was, uh, and it was correct. Uh, it is true that at the beginning uh, of the crisis, we had this, uh, this fear. And, uh, and it's true that, that uh, to tell you the truth, uh, the, the virus took everyone, everyone by, surpri by surprise. The Chinese were totally uh, taken by surprise. They asked for our help uh, beginning of January this year. They were not prepared. And we provide 56 tons of, of the medicament, money and so on, uh, uh, protective equipment. They were not ready. Uh, needless to speak about uh, our African friends, where I say, if you, um, if you believe that it's fragmented in, in, in Europe, what will you say in the US? Gosh, I lived many years of my life in the US. Never I thought I will see uh, New Jersey closing its frontier, its bridges, uh, um, with, a, with a guard, with, with guns, 
uh, uh, gosh, uh, what about Michigan? What about Florida? What about but no, but, no, but, no, but, no, but, no, 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 but it's important. What do I want to say behind this? At the end of the day, I'm not, I do not criticize anyone. I'm just saying that this virus or the propagation of the virus do not match exactly with the frontier of our continent, with the frontier of our countries, with the, bo with the, with the frontier of our regions or cities. And, and of course, we will see, and I think it's pretty important. We will see, and we are starting to see now, it's true, uh, uh, um, uh, in Europe, uh, different position regarding the scientific measurement or progression of the pandemic. So now, behind your question, what, what is important? What is important is that at least we have the clear, the, best, the same rules, green, Yellow, red. We had a discussion, a lot of, uh, we discussed with, with, with President von der Leyen on this, a lot. And, and, and you may see good proposal uh, on this, just to harmonize, to harmonize again uh, uh, where a region or a city or a country is red, and then take the same decision where it's yellow and when it's green. That's for health and for the people, which so are the Commission most important. is going to issue. Well, of course, we are working a lot here with the Coreper, with member states, and you will see soon, very soon, uh, uh, things that we propose here, just to have the same measurement tool, thanks to ECDC, which is doing a great job uh, that we will be able to use to have the same common measurement. And we have, of course, all this data. Now, regarding the, the internal market, it's true. Uh, to tell you the truth, uh, when I, uh, for the first, uh, the, uh, when, 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 when we had the first wave of the crisis uh, uh, in March and April, uh, um, I had 18 countries that I, I, I had to go behind and say, hey, you should reopen your border. It's not legal. And so, so I had to discuss one by one with the minister at the end of the day. It worked, and it worked pretty well. Much better, by the way, than in the US, because uh, Washington cannot convince any governors, believe me. But we were able to do it. So I think we, we can be pretty proud of the way we did in Europe. But... Lesson learned. I wrote a letter yesterday to all Minister of Industry, reminding them what we did well, right and wrong in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the spring. And if we will have, let's say, a new evolution of the pandemic, what we should and they should not do. It was sent yesterday. Hungary announced to close its borders more or less completely for, uh, for tourists, at least, as of today. Is that a specific situation that you would so have that's a that's comment for, on? Again, for tourists, we will see. We will see if, uh, if the pandemic uh, justifies this. Uh, and that makes the difference, of course, for tourism. You know, we are in Brussels. And we know that in Brussels, the city of Brussels decided was probably a little bit afraid uh, of all the tourists coming back in the, in, in the region and, uh, or in the city and took a, a pretty tough decision, and I don't blame. And it's their responsibility, just again, to make sure that uh, uh, we will not have a new flow of, uh, of, uh, um, of evolution of the pandemic. So I, I, I don't know about the situation, uh, the health situation in, in, in Hungary. Probably a lot of uh, 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 Hungarians are coming back from vacation. What I could tell you is that I don't see anything today at closing border of Hungary or any other country uh, in terms of uh, uh, well-functioning uh, of the single market for goods and services. Commissioner, uh, it's one year in, more or less, for the new commission, for the von der Leyen Commission. Not for, for me. The, not for you, true. Still, uh, as we speak now, after the summer, uh, at the beginning of the second year, more or less, so cycle of the, of the commission, uh, what is the main difference for you um, uh, between, between working for a shareholder and working for uh, well, the EU citizen. Florian, it's not at all the same thing. All my life, I've been used to work in different environments. Uh, like a fish, if we could uh, accept this uh, image, has to adapt to different uh, uh, water. And uh, I've been a professor. I taught about governance, both public and private. I thought a lot about it. I've been um, elected vice governor of a region. I've been a Minister of Finance, as you know, mm. and I've been also a CEO. Uh, so I know that these are not the same things. I know that you need to listen to your stakeholders and at the end of the day to do your job. But as I say in France, 
Et une Bruxelles, Florian Je suis comme un poisson dans l'eau. Like a fish in the water, of course, for, for those. Uh, And I don't say this because of the weather. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I was told by, um, by one colleague of yours that I will not name, of course, that you're a very good, uh, even a brilliant um, observer of group dynamics in the college. What is your uh, take on what has changed the, in the group dynamics in the college over this crisis? Now, first, I would like to tell you that one of the big, uh, and the big surprise I had, yet all my fellow colleagues, they're all amazing people. And I'm really serious. They all have, have fantastic work-life experience. Probably if they have been designated, it's because they were what they are. So I'm extremely lucky to be able to interact with the quality of these people. That's amazing. And to tell you the truth, could be a difference also with, with the national government. <laughs> uh, probably the way you have to be selected, by the way, the parliament is not also a, a simple story, so at the end of the day, fantastic, fantastic team. And I'm not saying this, you know, uh, because of the personality of... Uh, so I love to discuss with them. I love to interact. Uh, I learn a lot when I'm discussing with them. I try also to exchange. I have also my subject. Um, it's, it's, it's great to be together. It's great. You are among the many other things that you uh, mentioned and described also a, a writer and a book author. Uh, which you, which you didn't, uh, didn't tell the audience here, but of course everybody knows. Can we expect a new book of yours anytime soon? <laughs> <laughs> And what would it be about? Alors, let me tell you something, a secret. My team will be very unhappy. I have already a book which is ready, but I was thinking when I will not be a CEO, I will publish this book. But now I'm a commissioner, so I have to wait. And the book is still at home, it's finished. I will not tell you what it is about. So wait five years. <laughs> you wait five years. <laughs> That is very good. Many thanks for this uh, revelation and for the very interesting <laughs> chat and discussion that we actually had over uh, the past almost uh, 50 minutes. Our time is up, I'll, I'll wrap it up here by thanking you actually, uh, Commissioner uh, Breton again for your time and availability for, for this discussion here. Uh, I would also like to thank again our partner Etno for making it possible. And to wrap up things here, I think we can look uh, together at the poll that you guys uh, online here answered. So the question was, what is the main impact of COVID-19 on the single market? And the 52% of the respondents, uh, and we've got 360 respondents almost, said there is still a lack of harmonization. So for example, uh, when it comes to member states' decisions on traveling at national borders. We discussed about this, uh, but you see from the poll here, Commissioner, that uh, indeed there is uh, still a lot to do for the Commission and for the Internal Market Commissioner. Thank you, Florian. Maybe. Um Next time, what would be interesting is to have the poll before our discussion and after. It evolved over the time of our discussion, oh, okay. indeed. Okay, great. Uh, <laughs> but it is a good idea that we will uh, that we will that we will keep. And it's actually what I just wanted to say um, uh, to the audience. Um, we will, of course, um, have more uh, virtual events over the course of the next weeks and months, uh, even this week we've got one. Uh, please check our website for uh, events updates, politico.eu slash events, uh, and then you'll find the future events. And one last question, please, to the audience. Uh, we would be all very grateful to send feedback, as the commissioner just did, uh, to send feedback to events at politico.eu, because it allows us to make uh, future events even better than this great one, which I again thank the commissioner for making himself available here and to all of you for attending. Many thanks. Thank you. Well,